greatest combines that have ever existed, and today we are gonna put it to rest. What's better, red or green? Run it again. Ah, oh, jeez, this video's already a disaster. We're three seconds in, we were supposed to have a class nine John Deere combine, but uh, it kind of broke and they couldn't get the parts, so. They brought this one out. Big thank yous to Van Wall Equipment and Titan Tire. Van Wall Equipment provided all of the John Deere equipment in this video for us to use. And Titan Tire provided the super wide, ginormous Ganthor LSW1400 tires. Behind me we have two of the largest combines in the world. On my left we have a 2014 Case IH 9230 Class 9 combine, 500 horsepower, an absolute animal. On my right! In the green corner, we have a 2021 John Deere S780, 473 horsepower. Over the last 30 days, I've spent 50 hours in each of these machines to finally conclude who makes the better machine, red or green. Before we jump into the comparison and see what's better, I need to throw in a little disclaimer. This 9230 is not the largest red machine that Case makes. They actually make a 9250, which is this machine, with a little more horsepower, a little fancier cab, a few fancier sensors, and a bigger grain tank. Maybe a longer auger, a little faster on loading speed. Other than that, the 9230 is essentially identical to the 9250. And this 9230 is not stock. We have 50 horsepower added to it with a tune, so it's 550 horsepower which is what the new 9250s are. On the Deere side, the S780 is not even close to the biggest combine that John Deere makes. They make a 790, they make an X9 1000, and an X9 1100. All of those combines are stair-stepped bigger than this one. But for the average farmer, an F780 is gonna be the largest combine most farmers are going to run. And if they want it to be a 790, which used to be the biggest combine John Deere made until they came out with the X9s, they could throw a tune on this to go from 473 horsepower to 543 horsepower. And then they basically have a 790. So the red one is a class nine machine and the green one is a class eight, but really the differences between an eight and a nine is just horsepower. When conditions get tough, the higher horsepower machine is gonna be able to maintain that higher capacity going across the field. But in my testing we did this year, we were in 15% corn, which was extremely dry. So they both had identical threshing capacities. Both of these machines are rated at 6,000 bushels an hour. We can push the machines to that, but with these dry conditions, grain just goes right out the back of the machine. Sure, we're getting 6,000 bushels an hour inside of them, but we're also spitting a bunch of corn out on the ground. So more realistically, to do a good job, they both did around 5,000 bushels an hour. Now that we're on the same page, we're gonna be comparing these machines in six different ways. We're gonna start off with the price, then we're gonna go straight into the performance. Then we'll take a nice hop up into the cab and we're gonna see where we're gonna spend most of our time. Tires versus tracks, what is actually better? Then we're gonna go back in the cab, go over the technology inside of there. We're gonna go over the technology inside of the machines in general. And then last but not least, how accessible are these things? How hard are they to work on? Who's gonna win? I don't know. The S780 is currently listed for sale on Van Wall's website for $499,900. And the 9230 can be purchased for right at $200,000. Keep in mind, 2021, 2014. 2021 Case Age version of the S780 would be the Case Age 8250. I found two of them for sale with similar separator hours on them. One for $415,000 and the other one for $454,000. 700. Well, the case may be a better price. We have to keep in mind that green ones typically have better resale value. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the endurance race test. Here are the rules. You must go 100% engine load and you stop once corn starts running over the hopper. Oh, we got a doozy today. We're on tabletop where the rows are half mile long, perfectly flat. This should be an exciting race. Oh no, the case machine's been disqualified from the race due to dirty fuel filters limiting its speed. Well, that's unfortunate, but we should be able to hang on for the endurance test. Very simple test. 
Both machines had damaged corn, however, the case machine had less cracked corn, the ground corn was in larger pieces, and there was significantly less trash in the tank. We're starting out with an empty grain cart, and then we got a full tank on the deer. This is the performance of the deer at 100% engine load. This is the performance of the case. These are the cobs behind the case combine. These are the cobs behind the deer. The deer cobs still have the tip of the kernel in them, so this puts us neck and neck in the performance category, but the job of a combine is to collect as much of the crop out of the field as possible. We're gonna give Case the win on this one. The combine operator is going to spend 99% of their time inside the cab, so this is one of the most important criteria. This is four and a half miles per hour in the John Deere. This is the Case machine at four and a half miles an hour. These fine red leather Recario seats are one of a kind. Wait, these aren't Recario? Oh, no. Case age branded. Never mind. If you want as close to Lazy Boy leather recliner chair that you're gonna find, you're looking at it. This thing is incredible. It's got the nice scoop for you to sit inside of, and it's also got these traction bars. So when you're sitting in there, you kind of catch your legs on these so you don't feel like you're gonna just slide right out of it. The leather is incredible. If you get a little bit of grease on you or something, falls on the seat, you just wipe it right off and it's clean. Name and adjustment, this seat has it. We can go forward, back, we can go up, down. I have no idea what that one does, to be honest. And we can recline the seat back if we want to, which you can't go that far because you'll hit back there, but got forward and back. Then we also have on the side of this, we can go up or down with air, so you're sitting on air ride suspension. And then we also have a heated seat button with three different settings. Leather armrest, once again, super easy to clean. Then you got a little spot you can kind of tuck your pens and stuff in underneath. And like any good vehicle after 1964, this is equipped with a nice seat belt. It goes right across the lap, holds you in there nicely. I had never been in a John Deere machine before, so the S780 cab, was a, a whole new experience for me. The cockpit seat is made of some of the most fine Italian leather known to man. Sorry, this is a John Deere branded seat. But this is nice leather material. We got the functionality that we could ever want. We got all sorts that we can go forward, back. We can go up, down. We can even swivel the seat side to side. Now, I, there's buttons on here. I don't even know what they do. My favorite thing, we got the air adjust seat. We got the heated seat, and we also have an air-conditioned seat. And it's a weird feeling, let me tell you. There's a nice cush to this seat. It doesn't have the traction bars on it. It's just smooth, but it keeps you in on the back. It's a little longer, really a comfortable seat. Got the weird looking seat belt though, but hey, it works. It's even got a special release. You can press it on the side and you can also press it on the top. How nice is that? The armrests are kind of a pleathery material. Really easy to clean if you get some grease or anything on them. The right armrest, nice pleathery material as well. Not quite as long, but still very comfortable for the arm. And then there's a pretty decent little cubby underneath of there. The buddy seat on the other hand, unless you have the posture of a nun, you're getting three quarter cheek on there. Seatbelt, absolute necessity on this thing. Otherwise, you hit bumps, you're wearing slick pants, you're falling. Out. The body seat's pretty plain Jane. It's, as far as sitting in it, has a little bit more cup at the back, so you still get that three quarter cheek inside of it, but it doesn't feel like you're just gonna slide right out of the front. A little more comfortable, but this does slightly resemble more of a geography class chair from like 1964. Not quite as cushy, but we have the nice leather. Once again, really easy to clean. The top does flip down, so we have a nice little table spot. This is just basic plastic though. Stuff's pretty slippery on it. You set your phone on there, 
slides all around. It does have a good size lip to it though, so you don't have to worry about it sliding off on the floor. There's a cup holder, not integrated into this, right on the back side with it though. But underneath the seat, this flips all the way up. Then, I don't even know what's in here. Oh my goodness, that's like a full size fridge. Does that open on the front too? Oh my goodness. That's slickered and snot though. You can have somebody sitting on that seat you can still reach in and grab what you need. It's a little warm in the cab. Just open that bad boy up. Get some extra air conditioning in here. While the seat is a little bit on the smaller side, I will give extra credit where extra credit's due. We got the nice red Recario le Case IH leather on top. And it's got some cush to it, so it's not like sitting on a chair in geometry class. Underneath of the buddy seat, we have a little refrigerator. We can throw a few drinks in there to keep those cold. And then the top folds down into a nice little table. Great place to eat lunch. And it's kind of like a non-stick material or a non-slick material here. You set your phone up here, you set your plate, your whatever. It's not gonna slide around. It's got a nice little lip going all the way around the top too. So you don't have to worry about it sliding off onto the floor. It's also equipped with cup holder. Speaking of cup holders, we have four of them in here. This one on the buddy seat is by far the best. It's not very deep, so that kind of does fall over. But it actually does seem to do a, a fairly decent job of keeping it from flipping out of there at least. This one's a little bit deeper than the one on the buddy seat, but there's nothing to hold anything inside of there. Do you get enough bouncing around? Look at that. She just falls right out. And these ones over here, those are kind of a joke. They. I, like, you'll just be driving along and next you know that stuff just falls right out. Cup holder wise, we got the big buddy seat one. You got all sorts of room. You can fit a big old thermos in there if you want to, but it's pretty deep, so you don't gotta worry about stuff falling out of it. And then on the right side, I don't know what it is with these half cup holders, but down here, look at that. It doesn't even, doesn't even hold that up. Then there's another one way down here. Check this thing out. We got a 16 ounce Red Bull. It just eats that whole thing. There's something even in the bottom. Look at that, there's some screws down in there. It'll swallow a whole water bottle too. Just look at that. Everybody take notes of that. They All cup holders need to be like that. A charged cell phone and a charged iPad are becoming more and more important in the farming world. So we need our cabs to be able to support multiple devices. So from a charging perspective, we have a cigarette outlet there. We have one way up here. There's one down in front right hiding there around the corner and then there's one between the buddy seat and the driver's seat right here you're not having a dead cell phone in this thing we got charger ports on charger ports there's one there two three four five six seven then we got one way down there eight ergonomically speaking this cab is set up pretty well all the machine functions are right here just right off just pivot the old right arm a little bit everything's just got a nice push feel button to it so you you feel nice click you know stuff engaged other than the parking brake that thing's a piece of junk our gear shifter throttle all the machine settings for the sieves fan speed concaves rotor speed spreader speed you can turn our four-wheel drive on from here these two yellow buttons turn the machine on and turn the head on we got the nice joystick everything you can grab from your thumb nice and easily there is one button on the back that you can press to have some different settings but you can easily reach stuff without having to you know, lift your hand way up to get to it. I don't have very big hands and it's pretty easy for me to hit everything. The stop button is a little bit out of the way, but I guess that's kind of a good thing because you don't want to be accidentally bumping that thing. That's your emergency shut off. But I mean, it's as simple as having your hand here and going like that. I do kind of like the fact that the key is not right here. You don't have to worry about bumping your knee on it when you pull your steering wheel down to you. It's hiding over here. Up top, we have all of our kind of our creature comforts. So you got the radio. I do have to lean forward a little bit to get up to that. Once again, I'm 5'10 on a good day. So if you were like six foot 11, then you could probably reach that from leaning back in your seat. But me, I gotta lean forward to get up to it. Honestly, I don't listen to the radio, but if I did, not the easiest to get to. And then all the light settings and stuff, flashers, windshield wiper, that's up here. Kind of same thing. I got to kind of lean over to get up to it. So when you're going down the road and you got to do something, you, you definitely have to take your eyes off the road to get up here. And then we have all of our cab comfort controls. Nothing too crazy. You don't mess with that a whole lot. You usually just do it once and you're good to go. But you do kind of got to lean over to get to it. the corn head we run and the row guidance we run are aftermarket to this combine so they are not integrated into this handle so we can't just press this to turn our auto steer on we have to either lean up and press the button up there or we have that little foot pedal that you have to click so 
Got another thing to kind of mess with on the floor that can get moved around and sometimes you're going along and you got to reach down to get it. Then the corn head folding functions, also third party. So we had to run it through the floor and we have this thing suctioned cup to our window. And sometimes that will fall. I run an iPhone Megasaurus X. I think this is the 14. It's the big one. The Max, I think is what it's called. But the little phone spot they have for you, it fits in there good. It, it's still got some room and it sticks in there nice you don't worry about it falling out we added a speed knob on this combine absolute must have for turning around quickly the little foot button down there for adjusting the steering wheel you can bring it all the way down touching the seat if you want to or you can go all the way forward nice and easy and then by pulling this top lever you can also get the top part to swivel so if you want it a little further away from you but closer you can do that. The Harley pegs to put your feet on are about perfect for me. Once again, I'm 5'10 on a good day. If I fully extend my leg out, I'm still not touching the window. But if I point my toes, I am touching the window. So if you're taller, maybe you won't be able to stretch your legs. I think we do have a little bit of adjustment in the seat where we can go further back. But I think it's pretty comfortable the way it is. And then if you also have a really wide foot, the brake might kind of be in the way and you might have to rest your foot over here instead. Ergonomically speaking, the John Deere is a work of art everything is right here i can literally just drop my right hand down and i can touch everything that i need to change in this entire machine other than the radio which is up here and then my left hand that's on the steering wheel can turn my lights on which is right here and i guess the keys on the right side of the steering wheel but this is so nice you have all your gear settings right here this is the pro drive in it so like i can hit one i can set my max speed so I can go like full stick forward. I can keep it going one consistent speed all day. So at five mile an hour, that's where it stays. All the buttons are fully customizable. A whole set of buttons on the back side of the stick. There's four of them here. Same thing. You can do what you want. You even got a little dial back here you can do stuff with. Just the customizability of the button options, phenomenal. I don't have anything on the floor. It's all wide open other than I got my brakes and I got my steering wheel adjustment. I don't have to click anything down there. Everything is fully integrated on this machine. So if I want to turn around, click my auto steer on, just boop, hit my button. We're going where we need to go. The phone slot in this machine, it fits my phone, but you got to kind of turn it like 45 degrees. It's a little bit snug in there. Once again, 5'10 on a good day. My feet are actually touching the window right now and my legs are not all the way out seats basically all the way back so i'd say you're actually a little closer to the windshield in this one than we are in the red machine we do not have a speed knob on here so that's definitely a must add the steering wheel will come all the way down pinning you to the seat then going forward it stops right there so if you're a seven foot twelve you'd definitely be bonking your knees on this trying to get in and out little little tighter sometimes you're going along and the sun is right in front of you it's really nice this machine has these nice pull down things got one on the door side as well and then there's one that's behind you can still see through them but it does do a lot of knockdown power and looking directly at the sun there is not one on this right side for whatever reason I guess the sun never goes over there. This vent and then this one over here are your only personal ones that actually point at you sitting on the seat. Otherwise, this one goes right at the door and then all these other front ones go right onto the window. Big old windshield wiper that works really well. This machine is not equipped with the sun blockers on the door. There is one right here in the front that comes down. This one's not a see-through. It's a little bit harder to see what's going on on the other side, but if you're looking at the sun, I guess you don't really care about that. And then there's not one over here, and there's not one behind. We definitely have more options to put air on us in different ways. It looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six things pointed at us. Then there's nice vents that go on the front window to keep that from fogging up. A little bit smaller windshield wiper, and then we got the baby windshield wiper on top, so that's a little weird, but... Yeah, I guess if it works, it works. Lightwise, we rock these big LEDs and then we added some extra ones around as well. The only thing I can compare it to is looking at the sun. The little circle lights are the LEDs and then the big oblong oval looking hot dog shape. I don't know what you want to call them was. Those are just the regular incandescent. That's also what's down here. Compared to the sun over here, the lighting on it's like you're holding a candle in front of you storage wise in here a little bit on the smaller side we got these little plastic covers to things you maybe fit a water bottle down in here there's one right here there's one over on this side behind the seat we got a nice little you probably fit a sweatshirt in there i mean it, it's holding this roll of 
paper towels pretty easily. Underneath the seat, we also have some extra storage, nice little cubby spots. I do like, why are you beeping at me? I do like this, how it, it's kind of contained. So if you put something in there, you don't have to worry about it rolling out underneath your feet. The backside of the seat also has the same thing. This is actually built with some functionality here. We can put stuff down here and we don't have all the wires running in the way that can get caught on stuff. So this is actually a usable area on this side of the seat. Technically speaking, this cab may be smaller, but just the way it's laid out and the functionality of it, it feels bigger. There's also a nice little storage spot here in the door. If you want to put your cookies or something in there, I like to put my gloves in there and kept them off the floor and I always knew where they were. Storage wise, this combine is phenomenal. We got cubby here, cubby there, a little cubby there. We've got a nice deep cubby there. There's one behind the seat and there's another big, nice deep cubby. There's a whole sweatshirt hiding down inside of there right now. Got the little spot we can put stuff. Then these are deep. I mean, got a water bottle, easily fits the whole water bottle inside there and actually tucks around the corner a little bit. Got three layers of that. There's a cubby hiding up here above the buddy seat. Then this little thing can flip open as well. You can store stuff up inside of there. Above the radio, there's a spot big enough to put a phone or a few small things inside there. And then there's one back there. Underneath the seat on the back side, it's also a little more difficult to keep clean in there. And it's also kind of a cluster mass of wires. The back window kind of has this like clothy kind of finish to it and the ceiling is also like a felty type material but everything else is just this I mean to be honest it's kind of a cheap plastic feeling to it a lot easier to clean dust settles on it we can just wipe it right off and don't have to worry about it retaining the smell and speaking of smell if you took a brand new Tupperware container and threw up in it and then rinsed it out that that's the cab smell it, not really a big fan of it. Actually, cool. I have something to admit. <laughs> the cleanability of this floor is really nice. We don't have a big lip down here, so we can easily get that stuff out. And the finish is right up to the upholstery and everything. So we don't have to worry about dirt hiding in little crack or crevice. Really easy to sweep this out. They even have it designed where it just goes right around the A-post and then it drops down this little slot. I'm a fan of that. Keeping this cab clean is not really the easiest thing because the fit and finish isn't really the best. You get dirt kind of falling down into here. Hard to get a vacuum in there as well. And then under the seat, just a lot of little cracks and crevices. We do have a cloth backing to everything so that dust just kind of falls right into it and stays there. Holds smells really well. I mean, the seat, kind of the same thing. Just a lot of little cracks and crevices. If you have vacuum, works great, but trying to wipe that out, a little more difficult. The cab, smell-wise, it reminds me of a used hotel room that's been smoked in a lot 10 years ago with a hint of the pool down the hall. Case is up, two to one. LSW 1400, standard Case IH 36 inch wide tracks. What's better? They say it takes five and a half pounds of pressure to break an egg. So we're gonna bury an egg and then we're gonna run it over. And since we're not professionals, we brought in a tire expert. I am the professional. I'm Scott Sloan, Ag Product Manager, Titan Tire Maker, Goodyear Farm Tires, out in the middle of a cornfield with coal. Well, you're that guy at the circus. Weddings and bar misfits. This is our LSW 1400 30R46, largest ag tire in the world. LSW stands for low sidewall. So we actually designed these with an intentionally a lower sidewall. We're able to run lower inflation pressure, creates less ground bearing pressure, less compaction, and we're gonna run over this egg. Did not break. But cool! It was between the legs! Oh, I just barely cracked it. It's still intact. vehicle rolling over an egg. I think a little crack is probably... You're heavier than a combine? I know. What I... do you think the track machine is going to do? I think it's going to crush it like a scrambled egg. Oh, 
Oh, she broken. Cool. That's what we got left. Where those bars are, that is so hard. I cannot scoop through that at all. Holy smokes. But then this is nothing. So that just shows between the lugs is doing nothing. Like that's not even compacted at all. They didn't even push against it. That's as loose as can be. You can see behind me, it took 25 and a half feet from full turn to full turn on the red machine and 15 feet on the green machine. an extra $50,000 a piece or $100,000 a machine. The LSW 1400s, $15,000 a pop or $30,000 a machine. Boogity, 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 we're neck and neck. We have two different types of technologies in the 9230. This is the Pro 700 monitor. This has been around since at least 2014, I think 2012, 2010. It's been around for a while. As far as I know, the new case combines run the same monitor. This does all of the machine functions. We know how everything is running based on this thing. And we can also set all the diagnostics of the machine and how far we want stuff open, closed, speeds of stuff. It's all ran through this. This is all machine oriented. If you have any problems, stuff on here is gonna light up and kind of tell you what's going on. All of these buttons control all the settings we have on the screen. Then these bottom parts control all of our losses where they monitor the losses we have going out the rotor, the sieves, and then our tailings. And then we can see our fuel gauge, our def gauge, and then our engine temperature. Then this other monitor is our Ag Leader in Command 1200. This runs the guidance, so the auto steer for the combine and it also runs all of our yield monitoring and mapping and we'll see if this is set on a field yeah there you go just a singular monitor in this one we can have full customization of how we want these pages laid out and then we can also get into every little setting of this machine so if we want to focus on what the header is doing we just punch that in there boom we can change our settings everything's super simple it's like a three-year-old could have run also got nice buttons on the bottom as like quick buttons to get to certain menus and up here on the a post that's where all the machine functions are we got our loss sensors fuel temperatures that kind of thing we can monitor all that through there the yield monitor in the john deere it's clunky we click on this map and we try to go to different settings on stuff and it just i I don't know. I don't like how you have to click into all the little buttons on stuff and you you can't zoom out by pinching your fingers. Like I can only zoom in right here and I I don't know. It just it's not very teachable in my opinion. There's I really don't know how to navigate this at all and I mean I'm 25 years old. I should be tech savvy enough to be able to navigate stuff, but this is kind of fit giving to me. Our monitors are collecting all sorts of data all day, multiple pieces of data per second, and shooting it up to satellites in the cloud, and it's storing it in the brain of this computer. We need to be able to access that information. And we do that through our phones now, so we can download apps in order to get into those things. The Deer app side of stuff, I'm not really familiar with. Cooper has it on his phone. He was showing me stuff on there. It looks like there's a lot of functionality to it. Really easy to access your information. To track everything that's going on through the Ag Leader Yield Monitor, I can just get on my app right here and it sends all the data right to my phone. So once again, pretty stinking simple and it's nice. You can go to any field you want. Like here we're on Winona. So it's the whole yield map. I wonder where the wet spots were on that farm. That's second to none in my opinion. I know AFS Connect, I think is what it's called. Yeah, right here, AFS. They might have something, but I 
I've never been introduced to it before. We're going along in the field, the name of the game is to stay going as consistent speed as possible to avoid flooding the machine with extra grain or running empty at times, but also then we can just stay going nice, consistent, and we're more efficient rather than <laughs> To combat that, this machine is equipped with cruise control. So we can hit these buttons. This is our first gear and our second gear, our first speed setting, second speed setting. If we hit that one, it'll pop up with our max speed on top of the screen. We can set our max speed at whatever we want. So if we're in the field and we just want to go five mile an hour, we'll just turn that to five. And then we will not go any more than five miles an hour, even when we're full stick at full throttle. When it comes to cruise control on this machine, I've heard you can set a cruise control to it, but once again, it goes back to the simplicity and the teachability of this monitor, because I don't know where to find it. So we just go off the engine load. When it gets to 100%, we slow back a little bit. If it's not quite there, we speed up some more. So you're constantly going back and forth. It definitely eats into your productivity, because sometimes you're not going as fast as you could be, and sometimes you're going too fast, maybe kicking some stuff out the back. To engage our auto steering, really simple. We just literally hit the button that says auto and it goes beep beep and we can even program these buttons to do the same thing as well so in this case when i hit two it turns auto steer on but at the same time of hitting two it also lowers the head to the ground since the egg leader stuff is aftermarket guidance we have to run in separate guidance we can't just press the integrated button on the joystick so in order for us to turn auto steer on we either have to hit that button down there and sometimes that thing gets kicked around or we have to hit the little steering wheel button up on the screen. These buttons already are programmed for different things. So like this button here, when we hit that, it will lower the head and it can automatically engage the auto steer. But we have to be in corn because the software we run in corn for auto steer is able to automatically kick in when the head lowers. But for everything else, I mean, what the button is, is what it does. You can't program these ones for anything different. They're all pretty simple. This is very teachable and simple as well. When we have problems or the machine's doing something that we don't like, we want the monitor to notify us. So, you know, we get our attention over here and it does that through senses of beeps and noises, buzzes. The sounds on this are really pleasant. They're just a nice soft beep beep. Unless you have the machine running and you get off the seat and you don't hit the parking brake, then the horn will start going crazy on it. Just as you get to the ladder and it scares the crap out of you about to fall off. The patience it can take running this thing with the random beepers and gawks and everything that it does at you. Once you figure out how to turn everything off, it's not too bad. But before you turn everything off, before we learned how to do that, every 30 seconds. All the time. So once you figure out how to turn all the beeps and buzzes and 20 things that come on every 15 seconds, it's actually not too bad. This part of the AA post measures the losses that come out of the back of the machine. So this is the sieve loss, I think it's the rotor loss, and then that's the tailing. What's really nice about those things is it's not just some random figure that is going off of on the loss. You actually go out, look at the ground on the back of the machine, and you can set that as your acceptable level. So if you're losing, let's say, six kernels per second out of the back of the machine, and you hit that button, it says, okay, six is acceptable. So when you start hitting seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Then these numbers actually start going up and it shows you you're spitting out more than what you said was acceptable. So it actually gives you something to gauge your performance off of. The bottom part of this monitor is all of our losses from the machine. So this is the rotor loss, the sieve loss, and then this is our return tailings. What I don't like about those is I have no idea what that is based off of. When you see that line move, you don't know what it means because there's no way of setting it to normal or what you have as an acceptable level you just see the lines move and sometimes it's in the yellow and you get out and then you look and stuff looks fine and then other times you get out when it's been on the bottom of green and you're finding more grain than you would like there's really no way of being able to set a performance gauge based off that. running equipment is vital to us getting done during harvest and sometimes the usual person to run a piece of equipment cannot always be there. That means you have to put somebody else into the seat or you're running multiple pieces of equipment. So it's inevitable. Someone else is going to have to be running a piece of equipment. So that means stuff needs to be really simple for us to learn and it needs to be teachable. So I can easily pass it on to Nava. I can easily pass it on to Cooper or Dad. In my opinion, the yield monitor on this, all that tracking stuff is not very easy to set. But once again, I'm not used to it. But for me coming in in 50 hours, I still haven't been able to learn this, still don't understand it. I could not teach that to somebody right now. Setting a guidance line, pretty simple. Do a new one of these, you pick your thing. As for all the other functions of setting the machine, all this stuff pretty much walks you through it. Really easy to teach, 
really simple. I especially like the fact that there's a combine advisor button right here. You hit this optimized performance button and then it gives you all these things going on with the machine. So let's say I look back into my grain tank, I have cracked grain. Oh, hey, we have broken grain. So I click on it and then I can determine how bad my cracked grain is. Uh, like, okay, let's say it's moderate. So then it'll actually recommend what I do to the machine. I can hit apply and it'll change all my settings. It'll change my upper sieve, my lower sieve, fan speed, rotor speed, concave. You can do all that through here. In the past, you had to get on your phone. You'd be finding all these forums of what people have their combine set at. Or you get out the manual. That doesn't make any sense. So this, from a teachability perspective, phenomenal. As far as I'm concerned, the teachability and simplicity of the Ag Leader monitor is second to none. This thing is awesome. I can put anybody in it. I can just get on a phone call with them and I can do whatever I need them to do on there and they can do it. They can understand it and they can replicate it later. And that's the really important. The Pro 700 monitor on the other hand, I really haven't done a whole lot of messing with it. And once we got stuff set the first time, we just kind of leave it there. I know people who work with these things all the time and still struggle with how these things are all programmed and how to change stuff in them. And here we are running into our final test with John Deere in the lead, three to two. On the climb up ladder, I do not like this top rung. You kick your boot in, you always hit this part right here and it's really shallow. And then this is directly on top of it. So like this, in my opinion, a really big tripping hazard. And then the way this big piece slides in and out, if you're on any side hill whatsoever and you have to pull that uphill, and especially if the wind's blowing into the side of the machine, it can be really hard to open that. And the same thing when you close it, if it's the opposite direction. And this top step, is a tripping hazard. You cannot quite get a full boot on it and you hit that back bit. I've seen Cooper fall down these stairs before and Ryan, our combine mechanic, said he's fallen down a few sets of these stairs because of that. Every now and again, we have to get into the grain tank to clean out certain things or something breaks. You just have to get in here every now and again. This one has pretty good stair steps, pretty good hand supports to get in over everything. This one's got a two by four added on the top, so it gives us a little extension there. But overall, the in and out, I, the back side, the engine side of the machine, pretty simple on the deer. The peeping windows on the front of the combine are really nice to see fullness. It would be nice if they did have them on the back corners as well. That way if the grain cart's over there, he can at least see in. Then the grain tank's got a pretty handy function inside of it. These little silver platter looking things, these are scales. Those scales are constantly adding up the weight that's inside the grain tank. So it tells you exactly what percentage your grain tank is full. And at the same time, it's also recalibrating your yield monitor all throughout the day. Climbing into the grain tank on this one, there's nice hand railings, nice foot spots. It's easy to get into. There's even some flat areas in here to stand. It's actually a little more comfortable than the deer. This machine is equipped with the power fold hoppers. So we can actually fold all of this in when we're done for the night, if it's gonna rain, it all seals itself up flat. While the deer machine behind us, that's always open, it's fixed. From a technology perspective, inside the grain tank, we don't have scales in here. It's just old fashioned. Once you start flowing corn over on top of the cab, you're full. This machine has this button right here, which that machine does not. There's augers that are in the bottom of the grain tank. When you hit that button, it shuts those augers in the bottom of the grain tank off. So then that way your unloading auger can completely empty out. So whenever you start it up, you're starting with an empty unloading auger. That one doesn't have it. It's a secondary add-on if you want to do it. You have to put a different clutch on the side. So otherwise, if you're not completely empty when you're unloading and you start it up again, your auger is completely full. Servicing the engine on these machines is something we generally do in the shop, but during normal run time, you wanna be checking your oils, checking your fluid levels, just kind of make sure stuff's okay. In my opinion, the get-to-ness of everything on this is kind of a little, little on the cramped side. To check your oil, you gotta climb way down here. I mean, 
it's nice and easy to get to but if you got dust coming up here you got a nice wind you got to open up this oil cap and it's kind of a big old cavern right there just in my opinion just asking for a lot of dust to get in there it's just kind of a confined quarters and then to get to the top of the engine you just flip down this little ladder thing pretty easy to get to and then you just flip this up kind of same thing if you got to get down in there into the fan and stuff not a lot of places to stand not a lot of room to move hydraulic wet reservoir is pretty easy to get to easy to fill the cap diesel tanks in a super convenient spot the cap being metal and having good grips on it is nice got good grip and the metal doesn't like tighten itself down on this other piece of metal so the pressure you put this thing on with is kind of how it stays. Jeff tanks right up front, right off the ladder, have the fuel trailer down below. You just have nice, easy access to fill everything. Getting to the screen on the side for all of your radiator covers and air filter and stuff. All out nice in the open. I don't know how you get under this big cover though. With the little platform right here on the side to be able to get to it. That is nice. You're not balancing over the side of the machine. The ease of access on this machine is pretty easy. We don't have anything in the way. Everything's open. Stuff can just fall right out the bottom, which is nice. Like to check the oil, we just have a regular, just a little dipstick right here. We can do the same thing for our transmission fluids. Hydraulic reservoirs right over here. We can see the level on, fill cap. Got a nice little platform. We can get to all of our air filter stuff. Nice and easy right here. Then these top bits. Just flip right up. We can get to everything super easy. It's just more open. Getting to the radiator and the fan though, that's not quite as easy. We don't really have a nice platform down there. So that is a little bit more not as fun. The def cap's nice and easy to get to. It's just sitting right here at the top of the stairs. You can also turn a light on up top so that way you can see while you're filling up at night. I'm not a very big fan of this diesel cap. This is plastic and this is plastic and it's like you put it on there and when you run it throughout the day, it's like it just tightens itself down so tight. Sometimes you get up here and it takes all the strength you have to try to get that open. And sometimes you gotta do that three or four times before it finally goes. It's also kind of at an awkward spot. You have to kind of stand balanced on the ladder to get to it, or you're bent way over at the top of the stairs. We do have some nice diagramming of all the grease zerks. There's 20 grease zerks that need to be greased around this combine. Now, some of these are 400 hour zerks, so I mean, you're gonna do them every couple years. And the case has 12, some of them are 300. There's a 600 in there, a lot of 100s, and then 150. The back spreaders on the deer, phenomenal. Whoever designed those for deer, hats off to you. You can pick in the cab how far you want them to spread, if you want them to go 100%, 40%, 20%, whatever. Any width you want, it, it would pat, throw past 40 feet easily. I, had, I was running them at 60% with a 40 foot head on, and I was hitting right on the edge of where I was cutting. So good job there i really wish the red machine had these one thing i really don't like about the john deere is to get to the sieves to climb up there and look inside of stuff we cannot go through these back spreaders this is fixed in place we have this little access window right here it's like a eight by eight and that's all you can see in there so if we have to get in there to do anything i'm not really sure how you climb inside of there and i'm sure this comes off in some way on the red machine we just pull this out right here on the other side we do the same thing and then we just pull this up and then you just sneak right underneath and you can literally climb all the way inside of it where one gains it also lacks because the spreaders on this we're only going about 35 feet wide at absolute full spread. Climbing into the back of the grain tank is great and all, but most of the time when you're in the field and you're adjusting the machine, you usually just try to go in right here. In the case of this deer machine, you're not technically supposed to do this, but everybody does. You just got these little chains to step on. You got the top of this. It's a little clunky getting up here. Then once you're up here, you got good visibility. Getting down on the other hand, not quite as simple so usually you got to kind of prop yourself and then you jump we do have this little access door where we can reach in and we can grab the grain out to see our sample the problem is once the grain gets full enough in the grain tank this has our old settings down at the bottom of the grain tank the new settings we just did are on top so that's when we have to climb up there front of the grain tank ladder on this one you actually don't have to climb up on top of the cab to get into the tank which is nice we have our little access door right here but otherwise 
we just have a nice railing and we can just grab the tank extension and do this. If anyone's a little bit older, or maybe kind of struggles with balance, I'm not the biggest fan of this little walkway because we have a little step up right there and then we take two steps and then we have like a six, seven inch step up right there. And then we get in the cab. I've had it several times when I was first getting used to this machine. I'd climb out of the cab and then I just drop off that and I'd almost fall. And the thing is you fall down that one, then you'll fall down that one as well. And then, I mean, you got a nice seven foot drop to the ground. This little step up is nice because it perches the cab up higher. So you have a little bit better visibility out the front because you're sitting up higher. But at the same time, that's also another tripping hazard. And I say I'm not used to that because the platform on the case machine is just flat. You just go right out, you have one step down and then you're on the ladder. So that one's got top, middle, bottom. This one just has the one. I will say this though, the case machine seems to build up a lot more material on this platform than the deer. And I don't know if it's just me, but these stairs feel so steep. Yeah, it feels like I'm almost climbing backwards when I go up them. If I have something in my hand as I'm trying to go up, it's really difficult to climb these with one hand. We're on this machine, they're kind of angled in a little bit. I can climb them with one hand really easy. It doesn't matter what color machine we have, they are going to break in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter. So when they break, what's that experience like? Are things buried underneath of everything and really hard to get to? Are they just positioned in bad spots? Like, what is that like? I like to call that the ease of accessibility. Starting out on the feeder house of the John Deere Combine, there's just a lot of stuff going on. There's a shield that goes over the top of this, pretty easy to pull off. There's just a lot going on here. On the red machine, this is the passenger side of the feeder house. We just have a few wires that run down to control our carrier aerial. And then this gray one does the folding functions on our corn head. But otherwise we have pretty much nothing other than a feeder house chain tension adjustment, our PTO hookup. Pretty stinking simple. The front of the machine, nice and easy to get into everything. I mean, this is basically how all feeder houses look in my opinion. The front of the feeder house, basically the same as any combine. It's pretty simple. On this other side of the feeder house, we have a lot going on as well. We got this big old belt. We got all these pulleys, got hoses coming in. Just a lot of action going on here. We got more up there. This is also, covered with shield. We just have a big PTO shaft that comes down to a gearbox and that's what drives our head. We got our hydraulic hoses. Everything's just, it's nice and neat. We don't have all the belts and pulleys and everything getting in the way. It's very clear cut and simple. One of the really big negatives of these SW 1400s, look how tight it is inside of here. If we gotta get to anything in here, if you're a small guy, I mean, you can still get in here, but if I was 300 pounds, no way I'm fitting inside of this. The accessibility of everything behind the tracks is phenomenal. We have a place where we can sit up here. Just look at all this room. We got all the space in the world we want to climb around inside of. And about anybody can fit in here. It's, it's roomy. All the outer shields on these deer machines, you just grab this little dial and then you pull. Pretty simple. Then you got a nice little cover from rain. You got some lights underneath. I do like this little panel thing right here. You can turn the lights on underneath or inside of the machine, wherever you want to. The shields on this machine, they have little Vs that indicate where there's just a little lever on the back side, and you just push it in, it comes right up. You can press these buttons to turn the lights on, on the bottom sides of the shield. There's a nice little platform you can step on to climb up to get up in here. We have all the shields off right now, they're on the ground, but this would be covered. There's like three shields that go here, there's two shields that go there. They fit in all these little holes. There's 10 holes per side that we have to put on to get just the cover on the concaves and the separating area of the road. The guards that go in front of here, look at this. Literally, you grab this and you turn it 90 degrees and it locks the guards in place. The other side, it just sits on the other side of this lip. You push this side flat, you pull that down, that's it. You have one shield here, you have one shield here. This one, you just flip that one down and then on the other one, you do the same thing. You can pop both those shields in in about 12 seconds with one hand. The simplicity of working inside these machines 
To me, it just seems like there's a lot of moving parts. For example, in the threshing area, we have all these belly augers that go across. So, I mean, it's just another bearing to maintain that's just getting beat up with grain all the time. There's one down there. We have to maintain these augers as well as these belly pans. Then obviously we have our concaves. I do really appreciate the simplicity of everything going on in the case machine. Under the threshing area, we have no belly augers. This just shakes back and forth. So the wear on this is extremely minimal. The separating area, really easy to get to. I think it's a little bit shorter in the case machine than in the deer, but we just have full, look, we can just look right into everything super easy and going into the separating area looks like that is the pre-cleaner down there this is the separating part of the rotor this looks to be pretty long from what i can tell there are not any transition veins up top that we can adjust and this machine is equipped with adjustable transport veins so we just loosen these bolts right here and then you just pick which slot you want them into looks like we got one two three four four of them we work our way to the back of the machine i mean it's a cluster of hoses and belts pulleys there's a whole lot a whole lot of going on back here we got our pulley systems our belts there's a ton of hydraulic stuff running around the filters are nice and easy to get to though this machine is not equipped with the hitch on the back of it if it did have one it'd be way up there this tailboard whatever you want to call it sticks out really far so you can't pull a trailer around or your head trailer around with you when you go from field to field you have to use another truck this machine is equipped with a hitch on it so we can hook our header trailer up to this so the combine can actually pull its own head from field to field which is really nice because then you don't have to have someone driving the truck to do it everybody can just be in a piece of equipment drive to the next field get started just keep going the passenger side of this machine is in my opinion where stuff starts to just it looks cluttered it may not be as bad to work on as i think but everything just looks like it's behind itself so if you got to get to the back thing you got to take all the front stuff off to get there and there's just there's a lot of moving parts in that equation and you have to get to the rotor on this side like for example i'd be climbing up here i'd be hanging on this stuff and i got the chance of accidentally ripping these wires off as i'm reaching in through here it's just it's kind of hard to get into and if you think you're going to get into the separating area on the passenger side of the machine good luck unless you're like three inches wide or if you can fit way up inside of there but regardless it, everything's just behind everything it looks like there's some more pulleys and belts hiding up there and up on the front here there's even more at least that filter is pretty easy to get to pulleys belts chains clean grain there's just a lot more open on this side look up here completely wide open we have full accessibility into the threshing area and the separating area is a little bit constricted but we still have a pretty good window i mean i can that's the back of it right there so we can still get in there super easy and really outside these concaves we, we don't really have anything we have to do in there the loading auger on the john deere has a fixed end to it and it's kind of bumped out so that way it, it pushes the grain further away but that took an adjustment to get used to because on the case machine it's got that little actuator on it so when you're going along you can move that spout it's completely adjustable and then when you're done unloading it tips itself back up and then you don't have to worry about a little trickle of grain on the ground well on this one it's just stuck there so if the grain cart was too close to you or too far away you couldn't bump it side to side like you can in the red machine the safety bar on these red machines is also nice one end it's on a hinge so you just lift it up push it out a quarter of an inch and it drops right down into place when you're done with it you just lift it up and it just sets right in the deer machine it kind of looks like a ninth grader in physics class design how this safety bar was hooked up it's just got this little piece of metal that it kind of sits on it's a nice little thin even the safety bar itself it just feels it feels kind of light i guess you could say just not as easy just doesn't feel as refined you want to see something crazy all of these are the shields that are on the red combine and these are the only ones that are on the green combine oh wait i forgot one uh, a couple more a few more uh, i should probably count these two and that's not all we also have this one the case machine has eight shields on it and the john deere has 20. now that's not necessarily a bad thing that's just more shields to have to take off to get into areas but there's just more more stuff that needs protected or 
something in place so you don't actually stick your arm in there. Well, looky there! We have ourselves a tie. Here's my honest opinion. If you're looking for a machine that's simple to set up, easy to use, not all that super fancy technology-wise, buy the case machine. If you want something so fancy and high-tech, you know every individual kernel inside the combine at any given time, their entire family, family tree, family line, what they do for a living, where they live, how much money they make, and their social security numbers, check out the deer. If I were to build the ultimate combine, I would start with a case machine. I would put a John Deere cab on it, all the monitors, all the internal technologies, but I would put the Ag Leader monitor for guidance and auto steer. Then I would take the John Deere grain tank, put that on the case machine, as well as the John Deere spreader. In my opinion, this would be the ultimate mix of premium technology and incredible simplicity.